morning, church. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Are you guys uh, Are you guys perfectly united in love? Yeah. Well, uh, we got perfectly united in love many years ago, but we rekindled that again last night. And uh, you may be thinking I'm blushing right now. I am. I'm just turning a little. I don't turn red. I turn burgundy right there. The red with the, the chocolate right there, and that, that's what you get. Uh, but uh, before we dig in, uh, number one, we've got to give George and Anna Helica a round of applause. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> unbelievable place. Uh, unbelievable setting. Uh, George totally, totally got me right there. I thought the queen looked at us. <laughs> I mean, but to the pure, all things are pure. Yeah. And that's how marriage should be in your eyes. It should be that purity right there. Yeah. Not only in your relationship with God, but also your spouse. Yes. And uh, of course, uh, we, we are honored to be able to speak to you today. Uh, not that we have arrived, because we know if you think you've arrived, you'll never get there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but we, we, we come before you as really just two sinners who've, who've been married by the grace of God. Amen. Uh, two, two people that God has called out of the darkness into the light. Mm-hmm. Two disciples that had such a impure wrong, sinful past that it literally is a blessing that we could be here today and stand before you Amen. and talk to you about God and about being married. We, we are just honored to be here to speak to you. There's so many of you here that have been married longer than us, been around longer than us. Uh, we're just honored to be here today with you guys. We love you very, very, very much. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, I, I, I uh, we've got to dig into the Bible now. Yeah. Yeah. United in love. It says in Proverbs chapter 18. Crack it open, bro. It says in Proverbs chapter 18, it says in verse 22, it says, He who finds a wife finds what is good. Amen. Amen, brothers. Yeah. I said, Amen, brothers. Yeah. Okay, he who finds a wife finds what is good yeah. and receives favor from the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And some of us needed wives. We needed wives to help us learn how to dress. We needed wives to help us learn how to talk. We need wives to help us learn how to think. We we need wives. Wives are good. And yet the scripture says, when you find that wife, you find what is good. Now it doesn't say, he who finds wives. And of course, Solomon had many wives. Dare we say he was the wisest fool in the Bible. And yet, the scripture just says, he who finds a wife, one what? Finds what is good. And receives favor from the Lord right there. Now, what, what, what's powerful is that as men, we, we, we are just lucky to have wives. Yes. But the scripture says, a wife is good. And so women, sisters, yes. are you good? Come on. Are you that which is good to your husband? Amen. Yeah. Are you good for his faith? Yeah. Are you good for his, 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 his heart? Are you good for him as a man? Do you build his confidence? Are you what's good? Are you that blessing that God longed to give to that sinful, wicked, wretched, non-dressing, over-talking, I want to fix everything husband? (laughs) Are you good? Don't talk about me. You know... The world hates marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, bro. This is also an attack today. We we are attacking the devil. That's right. With this particular conference here. Yes. Because the world hates marriage. Mm -hmm. The world sees marriage as a three ring circus. Mm -hmm. You've got the engagement ring, you got the wedding ring, and then you got the suffering. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why they don't want to get married. (laughs) <laughs> because there's so much suffering, but here's the problem with marriages in the world. Psalms chapter 127. Uh, oh. Psalms chapter 127. On. In verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord That's right. builds the house, yeah. its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early, stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Those who have a relationship with the Almighty God. 
sleep peacefully. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from Him. I mean, kids are a reward from God. You may not feel like that, but they are a reward. Amen. I know this morning I, w- I woke up, we got to get the marriage, we got to get the kids. Up. No kids. Amen. Awesome. Oh, amen. Let me, get, let me get spiritual here. They're a reward from the Lord. Stop me from being selfish. It says, like arrows in the hands of the warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. And the church said, Amen. Amen. the world hates marriage because they're not you. The, the Lord's not building their marriages. Yes. And so it isn't good. The wife isn't good. Things are bad because it's not built on the Lord's teachings right there. Yeah. But we here today, we want our marriages built on God's principles. Amen. Yes. Amen? That's right. A few facts about marriage to inspire you this morning. Positive facts. Women around the world are more likely to fall in love with partners who have drive and ambition, education, a sense of taking care of family with wealth, respect, status, a sense of humor. So maybe that's how some of us dress and stuff like that. (laughs) Men who are somewhat a little bit taller sometimes. Amen. (laughs) Women also prefer distinctive cheekbones, a strong jawbone like Martin Scott right there. (laughs) These are all linked to manly testosterone levels. During ovulation, women become even more interested in men who show these signs. Oh, wow. Men in love. Show more activity in the visual part of the brain. Hmm, I wonder. (laughs) While women in love show more activity in the part of the brain that governs memory. Scientists speculate that men have to size up a woman visually to see if she can have children. While women have to remember aspects of a man's behavior to determine if he would be an adequate spouse. A few other facts here. A marriage ceremony typically ends... With a kiss. Because in ancient Rome, a kiss was the legal bond that sealed contracts, and marriage was seen as a contract that could not be broken. Wow. Wow. Some of the negative statistics. Due to jobs, kids, TV, the internet, hobbies, work, family responsibilities. The average married couple spends just four minutes a day alone together. Over 75% of uh, who marry partners from an affair, divorce. Divorce. Married couples, <laughs> this is just, these are just some statistics, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Married couples tend to have larger waistlines, which can lead to a decrease in sexual attraction and general health. Additionally, the spouse's chances of becoming overweight herself increases if her partner increases Mm. in weight. Mm. Words form 7% of our communication with anyone, including, and most importantly, our spouses. The tone of voice accounts for 38% of what you mean. Body language is responsible for 55% of what you mean. So, words really say little. Actions speak much louder than words. Listen to this one. This is from Nancy Lehman and Helen Sullinger. These are the women who really are, are pushing forward the feminist movement. Marriage has existed for the benefit of men. <laughs> and has been legally sanctioned method of control over women. Oh, oh. <laughs> Male society has sold us the idea of marriage. (laughs) Now we know it's an institution that has failed us and we must destroy it. The end of this institution of marriage is a necessary condition for liberation of women. Therefore, it's important for us to encourage women to leave their husbands and to live individually without men. That's what the world teaches. 
Isn't that sad? What is the purpose of marriage? I'm glad you asked. Genesis chapter 1. I love Camelot, but before there was Camelot, there was Genesis. I love being a a, a prince, and I love my beautiful princess. But we've got to get into the the, the, the real heart of God when it comes to marriage. I I really never, I I mean, it's awesome when you do these lessons like this, because you you go, wow, it brings you back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, it says this. What first? I'll get there, bro. <laughs> let, let, let me preach. Let, let, me, let me preach, bro. Let me preach. Amen, bro. That prayer life in the morning helps you with anxiousness, right there. Genesis chapter one. Come on, Michael. <laughs> it says this right here. I love Michael. Verse twenty-six. So then God says, "Let us make man." Are you here? Chapter 1, verse 26 says, God, let us make man in our image. In our likeness. This is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So don't think God has three different people up there right there, okay? That's the three parts of God. It says, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creation that move along the ground. So God created man in whose image? His own image. In the image of God, he created him, male, female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, and fill the earth and subdue it. And the church said, the first relationship in the Bible was God with a man. Not God with a monkey. (laughs) It was not God. I don't care what the evolutionists say. The first relationship was God Almighty with mankind. Before there was the word science, there was the Holy Bible. Are you with me here? And it says we were created in his image. That hit me. Because it says that man and woman were created to mirror the image of God. That marriage is created, we were created to reflect the image of God. We weren't, marriage wasn't created. You, you one for, no. He says, so God created man in his own image. Right. In, his, in the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them. Then he said, he blessed them, said be fruitful. And it hit me. Marriage is created to reflect the image of God. Marriage is created to reflect the image of God. The man is required to reflect the image of God. Yep. Regardless of whether his woman is reflecting the image of God or not. The woman is required, she was created to reflect the image of God. Regardless if the husband is reflecting the image of God. We were created to reflect God's image. That's why you were married. God wants to see himself in you. God wants to see mercy in, in, in your marriage. God wants to see tenderness. God wants to see kindness. God wants to see his heart of total and complete love in your marriage. We were created in his image. Your marriage was created to reflect the image of God. We understand in chapter 2 what happens, of course. They come together right there and Eve was taken out of the side of the man out of his rib. We understand that one right there. We've heard that over and over. She was taken out of his rib right there. She wasn't taken, you know, and of course we understand, you know, you've heard me dispel the false teaching that Adam was a black man. Because it says he had to take the rib out right there. And no black man's going to give up his ribs. We understand that. We'd have to go into that one. But but she was taken out of the rib to be side by side with him. And when you get to chapter 3, it says, or chapter 2, verse 24, it says, For this reason, man will leave his father and his mother and be united with his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. And the church said, Amen. They were having a good time. I know, because they felt no shame. Total vulnerability with one another. Sin doesn't happen until chapter 3. Sin doesn't happen. The perfect unity does, gets destroyed by sin. What destroys Marriage. What destroy? We're going to get very simple today. What destroys the unity between a man and a woman? 
what, what, what happens when the ground gets cursed? When the ground got cursed in chapter 3, it's because they sinned. They sinned. It went from in this incredible paradise to painful toil. This incredible time in the garden of paradise to toil and suffering. Why? Because they sinned. They sinned. What destroys perfect unity is sin. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. God perfectly united us to reflect His image. And that's one of the lies that we can get sucked into. We think, I will be a good husband if my wife is a good wife. But you've got to be a good husband to reflect the image of God. I will be a good wife if my husband is a good husband. You've got to be a good wife to reflect the image of God. Your, your commitment is to God Almighty before your husband. Your commitment is to God Almighty before your wife. And what causes division in the perfect unity that God has designed is what it says in James chapter 4. It says this in verse four, 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? You ever read this one? Yeah. <laughs> it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Do you see how many times the word "you" was mentioned? Yep. <laughs> you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You think the scripture says without reason, spirit he caused to live in us, envies and testy, but he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves into God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. And the church said, Amen. you know what destroys marriage and destroys the perfect unity? Selfishness and pride. Selfishness and pride. Simple and plain. I think what, what really has hurt our perfect unity, us seeing that God has brought us together is selfishness and pride. Mm -mm. Just simple and plain. What's caused fights and quarrels is selfishness and pride. Selfishness says I am more important than you. Selfishness says my feelings are more important than your feelings. Mm -hmm. Selfishness says my hurts are more important than your hurts. Selfishness says, my weaknesses are are more important than your weaknesses. Selfishness says, my agenda is more important than your agenda. Selfishness says, my schedule is more important than your schedule. Selfishness says, my issues are more important than your issues. Selfishness says, if if, if you would stop being so selfish, you would see how how important I am. (laughs) The issue is, you're, you're so selfish, you don't see how important I am. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the problem with things right here <laughs> it's the mentality that you are the most important and in marriage I really believe we've got to be serving one another we can't be selfish we've got to be servants to one another are you serving your husband are you serving your wife selfishness says thank you for the gift And that's it. (laughs) Selfishness says, thank you for thinking of me. And that's it. Selfishness says, thank you for repenting of your sins. And that's it. Selfishness is all about you. Selfishness says, I have low self-esteem. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Having a low self-esteem is total selfishness. Because it's all about you. And it can destroy your marriage. And this scripture teaches us the path to unity... It's really humility. And if you are not willing to be humble, if you don't take the path of of humility, then you get the path that I've had. It's the path of humiliation. (laughs) See, 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 that's the you you go the path of humility, or God gives you the path of humiliation. He will humiliate you. And when you're humiliated, you're totally humble. (laughs) Totally humble. I didn't forget being in Portland, Oregon when the church got way out there and we were, we were in a, a, a situation where there was no discipling. No calling us to be men and women to reflect the image of God. Come on. 
My standard by which I would do everything would be Michelle. Her standard was me. And we kept messing up and bumping and arguing. We didn't know why. And we were both super, super, super selfish. And it got so bad, I started looking at internet pornography. I started looking at impurity. It was, it was wicked. It was evil. It, it, it got bad in our marriages. Thank God we moved to Los Angeles and got some great discipling right there. Amen. Amen. But, but I, I, I wasn't willing to, to, to humble myself. So many, so many, I, I just wasn't willing to be humble. I thought she was the issue. It was me. It was me. It was my lack of view that God is who I have to honor over her. He is that which is perfect, not her. And I fell and I got humiliated because I would not humble myself. What destroys our marriages is when we don't take the path of humility and it's all about us. Now I have three, 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 three challenges here, but of course I've got this lovely woman standing next to me here that the Lord has given me. And, uh, you know, we, we both are kind of 80s childs right there. Amen. 90s right there. Any 90s children in the house right there? 80s, 90s right there. Anybody remember Rick Astley? How did that song go, babe? Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down. Never gonna turn around and desert you. Never gonna make you cry. just like Rick Astley, right? And I think that, you know, that song, we put that expectation of that chorus, never going to give you up, I'm never going to let you down. And as women, we want that, that security, that hope that a man is never going to break our heart, that he'll treasure our heart and keep it safe. He'll never make us cry. He'll never say goodbye. And he'll never tell a lie or hurt us. And we go into our marriages with that idealism of perfection, of what we think is true love, true romance. And months go by, maybe years go by, and that's shattered. We lie, they lie, we say goodbye in our hearts sometimes, in our words, and we make each other cry. Mm-hmm. We make each other cry. And I'm just going to talk today about what I believe has been the biggest stumbling block in my marriage and has caused disunity is my fears. And if we, as, as we could turn to 1 Peter 3, we know this scripture hopefully by heart, the Christian women in this room. We know that Peter implores his, the wives, us wives, to be submissive to our husbands. He implores us to not adorn ourselves in outward clothing or hairstyles, but to adorn ourselves as the women of the Old Testament who adorn themselves in their hope in God alone. Not in Rick Astley's, never going to let you down, but in hope alone. But in verse, what I, the verse I want to focus on is in verse 6. And in, he says, You know, like Sarah, sisters, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord, you, my sisters, are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Mm -hmm. A major stumbling block for us wives is doing to doing what is right in our marriages, being unified in perfect love, is fear. Is fear. And I really believe as we mature in Christ we need to really get to the root of that why are we afraid why does the defenses come up when our husband does something or doesn't do something why is there pride why is there rebelliousness you know we can just go you're in sin but I think we've got to go deeper why do I do those things why do I withhold sex why do I argue why am I short why do I withhold affection why am I mean spirited because there's a deeper issue and I believe it's this 
Because it says right here, we don't do what is right because we're afraid. So he says, don't give way to fear. Don't give way, sisters. In the Amplified Version of the same verse, it says, let nothing terrify you, not giving way to hysterical fears or letting anxieties unnerve you. And I mean, really, I, when I speak to women, when I'm counseling women in D times, it really is the hysterical fears and the anxieties of life, yes. of how are we going to do this? My husband lost his job, or my, my son has special needs, or, you know, blah, 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 you feeling about, I'm getting old, I've got health problems, my son is a teenager now, my husband and I are close, he's not reading his Bible. We have these hysterical fears. Come on. You know, and First John 4 is such an antidote to this, and I think as sisters we need to really camp on this. Um, First John 4, if we could turn there, in verse 16, First John 4, let me go myself, I didn't, uh, First John 4, and so we know, sisters, and rely on the love God had for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. As Michael said, we are his image bearers. Yes. God created us in his image from day one. So we can be like Jesus when we rely on the love that God has for us. And this is it. In verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Perfect love brings unity, but fear brings disunity and conflict. You know, fear in and of itself actually is neutral. There's a godly, positive fear that we instill in our children. Be afraid of strangers, be afraid of heights, you know, be back by 6 p.m. teenager or 10 p.m. curfew time. There's a fear in God that we need to have to keep us from sinning. But then there's a satanic fear that I believe creeps into most of our hearts. It's a satanic fear that is not of God. And it's the fear and the unhealthy fear, which I believe brings punishment. The Bible says right here, suspicion. Satan twists our mind from the truth and then we fear people, we fear our husbands, we fear circumstances and then we're run by our anxieties to protect ourselves and that's where the, fear, the, the pride and rebellion come in. You know, this scripture says to cast out fear. Mm. That is a word that they use for demon, demon possession. Wow. Jesus yeah. cast out the, the demon possessed woman, the demon possessed boy. Fear is, I believe, ungodly fear is satanic. Mm-hmm. I'm yes. starting to see this and have a conviction myself. It needs to be cast out. Mm-hmm. How? Mm-hmm. I believe by focusing on what this scripture says in verse 16, that God is love. And His perfect love, not Rick Astley, not our husband, drives that out. The more we look to our husbands to feed, to feed, our, feed us with love and reassurance and faith, the more we're going to be disappointed. Yeah. The more we'll come up empty. The only thing that can cast out that demon of fear in our heart, sisters, is the Spirit of God and His love. And I really ask that you meditate on um, Google. I'll go into Bible Gateway and put in unfailing love. And just print out the 15 or so scriptures that that, um, that that will bring up. Because only a deep trust in the goodness in God will drive out, as I said, that demon of fear. Fear came in in Genesis 3, verse 1, when Satan said, Mm -hmm. did God really say? Mm -hmm. He said it to who? Did he say it to Adam? Who did he say to? Women. Michael actually brought up a good point. Women love or choose husbands out of actually a mental picture, out of Mm -hmm. memories and out of feeling. Men choose visually. Mm -hmm. So our mind sisters are really powerful. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Satan got in there, and, and the birth of doubt and fear was in Genesis 3.1, when he said to us, did God really say? And then uh, we said, yeah, did God really say? <laughs> then we got terrified, anxious, and hysterical. <laughs> no, he yeah. didn't. Yeah. Oh, no, I need to eat the fruit. God is holding out on me. <laughs> My husband, I can't trust him. He doesn't know how to lead this. I'm going to take over. Yeah. And we do that every time we yeah. sin in our marriage. I do that every time. That's the pattern. Yeah. That's the pattern. Fear, distrust. Okay, I'll just lead this up. Right, get out of the way. I can do this better. 
<laughs> that is not true and as a result Mike and I on every detail for about five years had conflict every week I feel sorry for the people that discipled us they must have just gone this is the most discouraging people in the world every time we come so how are you guys well we had a conflict it was just constant constant and I was look back now and I'm just like wow thank you God for the kingdom who really love is patient and love is kind and we need one another we would not be here today if it wasn't for discipling. I've been married before. I gave up on marriage. I am more predisposed to divorce just because I quit once yes. in the world. But it's only because of God and love and the discipling of, this, of the kingdom. But I, I want to read one last scripture, Isaiah 54, sisters, and I pray you camp on this. This is, this is our, should be our Rick Astley song, guys. <laughs> this is God singing to us in a much more beautiful way than Rick could ever sing. <laughs> even though he was, even though he was a, that was such a great song. We hopefully will, will dance to it tonight and laugh. But Isaiah 54, this is for us. I really believe this was written for a woman. It starts off with verse 1, seeing barren woman. But in verse 4, do not be afraid, sisters. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace you will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your Lord. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with deep compassion I will bring you back. And then down in verse 10. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. You know, David had the answer, I believe, and... In many, many of the Psalms, when you type in unfailing love, you know, David said, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Psalm 50, Psalms 90 says, satisfy me in the morning with your unfailing love. I really believe that a key to a unified marriage is our relationship with God, women. If we are strong and constant and loyal and faithful in a walk with God, in a deep walk with God, and we trust and rely on Him and on His unfailing love only, we will be the wise, and we will make God pleased, yes. and we will be daughters of Sarah. Amen. Three levels of unity. There are three levels of unity. Spiritual unity, emotional unity, and then there's physical unity. Look at the spiritual first. John chapter 17. Come on, Michael. As we bring it in for a close here, Come on, I, pr- I appreciate my wife's part of uh, just being a woman of God, but I appreciate all the women of God and all the men of God that are here. Uh, and last week, we had an incredible, incredible miracle happen. Of course, we discipled a couple, uh, a woman by the name of Lana Bogarts in the north region of Los Angeles, California, before we moved to London. And uh, many times, my discipleship time with her, because I became, I had a great bond with her. Uh, my my D times with her because she was one of the only ones that came to a, a campus Bible talk. She was a single mom who came to campus Bible talk. Wow. Um, her greatest persecutor was her husband. Wow. Eighteen years he persecuted her. Eighteen years he told her not to not not to go to church. Eighteen <coughs> years he told her not to go to Bible talk. Eighteen years he said I'm not giving special missions. I don't love that church or what they teach. They're cult. Eighteen years he was against. Last week he got baptized. <laughs> Because she was a godly woman. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Come on. Wow. John chapter 17. Come on, bro. Verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. This is what Jesus says. He says he's not only praying for the disciples. He says I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. So who are they? That's us. Yeah. Jesus prayed for this meeting. He literally prayed for this meeting because we are the ones who believe in Christ through the message of the apostles. Are you with me here? 
He says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them a glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Spiritual unity understands you need to be brought to unity. It doesn't just happen. You've got to be brought. Unity is not just a normal thing, guys. You've got to be brought to unity. Amen. Okay? But what unifies us? It is the Holy Bible. It is the Holy Bible. It gets rid of arguments. Yeah. <laughs> it gets rid of feelings. It, it gets rid of emotions. It gets rid of past experiences. Spiritual unity is unity based on the Holy Bible. Ephesians chapter 5. Come on, girl. We did a, week, a lesson in the uh, for our staff, and we talked about contempt. Yes. Just the looking down on. Right. And you hear the statement, familiarity breeds contempt. Yeah. You know, sometimes you can hear the truth over and over, and you can have contempt. Yeah. Or contempt of, of, of mm-hmm. the truth. Mm-hmm. You hear, I gotta leave. Oh. Contempt means you look down, you scorn. You hear, I gotta submit. Oh. And you can... You can show that contempt, that contempt can come up in your heart. Mm-hmm. Yet spiritual unity is highlighted by, by, by God right here. It just says oh in verse Ephesians oh. chapter 5. It says in verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything that makes sense. In what? In everything. In everything. That means if you are a derelict husband, your wife has to submit to that. That's what it means. If you are a no conviction, I don't pull out my Bible to disciple, your wife's got to submit to that. If you are a brother who doesn't evangelize, who isn't spiritual, who is not a biblical prayer warrior, your wife's got to submit to that. That's what the scripture teaches. She's got to submit to you in everything. Woo. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How much he loved the church, he died for the church. Come on, come on. And gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or blemish. And that's exactly what the sisters hate. Stains, wrinkles, and blemishes. <laughs> but holy and blameless in this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his body, feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we're all members of his body. For this reason, man will leave his father and mother, be united with his wife. It's a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband come on the only way to have unity in your marriage is to allow the holy bible to dictate that which is right and that which is wrong when your emotions your feelings and these other things start creeping on in you will not have unity your unity has to be based on scripture I don't care how challenging it is I really believe I've got to lead my wife in everything why because the bible teaches that I've got to do that I really believe my wife has to submit to me in everything. That's not me being arrogant. You, you, you hear the devil creep on into the church. Oh, that's, I can't believe you said your wife. <laughs> if you're really spiritual, you don't have to pull out the word of God. No, that's the devil. I, I pull scriptures out in a heartbeat. <laughs> this, this is what we got to do, honey. I got to lead. You got to submit. Okay? This is spiritual unity. Amen. Are you with me right there? Yeah. Amen. Come on. You got to have emotional unity. Mm. You gotta have emotional unity. I don't have time to go into all of it, but here's the deal. As a married couple, you've gotta have recreational things that draw you to one another. <laughs> Why? Because once you live with each other for so long, you just over and over, and you don't have anything that draws you together, you start to grow life separate from one another. And you become roommates in the same house where you said, Till death do me part. And that's because you have no recreational unity. You don't you don't do anything out, outside. I mean, you're just two roommates. You know, one of the things that me and my wife love to do is we, we love to exercise together. And it's cool because when we exercise together, we're spending time together. 
there's this there's this relationship that we're building. We're, we're doing it. We talk. How'd you do? What'd you do? What you eating the coconut water right now, babe? Oh, I'm doing this. Oh, I'm doing this. Oh, I'm drinking the green juice. I tried to give I tried to give the brother something they didn't want to take. What is? Oh, I tried to give the sisters. That, but when, even Prisca today, she goes, Oh, I see you've been working out. Woo, give a hug right there, and I look at Michelle. I was like, Amen. But we've got recreational things going on in our marriage that pulls us together and keeps us from growing separate. Yeah. When you have a recreational thing together, you, you, you're doing it together. I mean, what recreational things are you doing with your wife? Outside of studying the Bible and this, that, and the other, do, do you have any recreational things that pull you together, that create that emotional unity Amen. because you're spending time? The other thing is communication. You heard the stat that I read earlier. Four minutes a day. That's the average married couple. You got to talk to one another. Yes. Yep. I mean, I even saw it this morning. Some of us are so insecure. We had 30 minutes. Bro, are we starting? <laughs> Start. What time? We got to start, bro? I said, bro, we got 45 minutes. Yeah, what, okay. All right. Bro, bro, go talk to your wife. It's <laughs> all right. You got the time. We need to talk to one another. Yeah. Just to sit down and talk. Not disciple, not this, just talk. My wife thinks I'm odd sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, so babe, what's your favorite color? Because it changes for women. <laughs> I'm just quizzing her because my wife, she's, she's a different woman. Or, as a young, I got to keep getting to know this woman. I got to keep being a boyfriend. Oh, right. See what I'm saying? Yes. Some of us brothers, I mean, are you still a boyfriend? You still working out? You still taking the cards in there? Are you, are you, are you, are you see what I'm saying? We, we've got to have that recreational unit. And lastly, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. I'm trying to get a lot in here, guys. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We should know this scripture. Yeah. Verse 1. Now for the matters you wrote about, it's good for a man not to marry, but since there's so much immorality, each, one, each man should have his own wife, each woman her own husband. Husband should fulfill his marital duty to the wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband in the same way. The husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together. See that unity right there? Come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You've got to have physical unity. You've got to have physical unity. If you have spiritual unity, you're Mr. Bible, you take it out, you guys, you're in the scriptures together, amen. you got that emotional unity, but you aren't having physical sex with each other. You're not unified. Come on, Mike, come on, There's a storm waiting for you to happen, waiting to happen in your life. You, 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 you can't have physical unity and emotion. You're super close, but you're totally unspiritual. You've got to have spiritual unity. You've got to have that emotional connection with one another. And for women, I, I believe what I've learned is it's a lot of communication. It's not all women. And, and for men, it's kind of, we, we love to conquer. We love to do stuff. So that, that's why when there's a recreational thing that you can do with your wife, there's that unity right there. <coughs> don't, don't take her out shooting and stuff like that. <laughs> not too fired up about it. You, know, you guys may have to change your recreation. <laughs> but those are the three levels. Yes. I, I, I want to I challenge you. I want to challenge you, brothers. Every single week when you have your discipleship time. Number one, I want to challenge you to have a discipleship time. Come on, my man. It's not optional. We teach that to non-Christians, but how is that? A, how can we teach a non-Christian, but you don't do it in your own marriage? Yeah, right. I want to challenge you to have discipleship time with your wife. Encouraging, uplifting, put your heart into it. Just like you're speaking at a seminar, this is your wife. Have a cranking lesson for you and her. Give some nuts. Put together a lesson. Show your wife you are spiritual. Show her that you are you are the man of God that God has put in her. Show her things she's never seen in the Bible. Come on. Teach her with scripture. Inspire her. Get her going. Don't just wait for somebody to come in. Fix up your marriage. Amen. You be spiritual. If she doesn't change, be a prayer warrior. Come on. Prayer can move things. Amen. You got to be spiritual. Got to have that emotional unity. Spend some time with one another this week and just talk to one another. And then lastly, physical unity. I shouldn't have to say much about that. To God be all the glory. Yeah. Yeah.